My name is Ross Simpson and I head up the data factory at Thames Water in the UK. My name is Fernando Lucini, I'm the head of artificial intelligence for Accenture in the UK. Hi, my name is Tom Tang, I'm the chief technical officer for digital technology at Sainsbury's. Hi, I'm Roberto Maranca, I'm data excellence vice president for Schneider Electric. Uh, hi, my name is Mark Smith, I run a company called Contact Engine. Hello and welcome to this roundtable session on artificial intelligence and ethics. Now, it's going to be a very broad subject, but in fact, I've got some fabulous experts that surround me. Uh, so we're going to head through a bunch of questions that will apply to the general business sector. So I'm going to open this up with a very broad question about business and artificial intelligence. Do you feel that having an ethical focus on the impact of technology is something that is new to business areas using artificial intelligence? Or is it something that we should be used to in a maybe a different couch in a different way? Um, let's start with yourself. Um, no, I think the, the tenets of what artificial intelligence is about comes from uh, respect, about fairness, and it's around ethics. And those things should be built into DNA of a company. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to technology, Fernando, I'm going to bring this to you. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's true? Do you think your ethics are built in when it comes to tech companies? They are They are in the individual level, but not necessarily at the you know, group level. So I think individuals tend to want to do good. I think that's natural. Um, I think when you put a number of people together, maybe it's not that they want, don't want to be ethical, but the output may not be as, as well considered. But I think uh, technology needs also obviously has no consideration of ethics, right? Um, but people tend to be ethical, I think. I hope. <laughs> okay. And so, Tom, do you agree that having an ethical basis within a company is, is very important? And, and do you feel that it's talked about maybe as explicitly as it should be? Yeah, so I think the concept of um, ethics with artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, actually runs the spectrum of companies in terms of, you know, um, what decisions they're making, right? And then also what is the risk that uh, the decisions provide. So in, in some aspects, some banks, they actually have a very mature um, risk um, department or risk um, decision process, whereas in some of the more, um, I guess, emerging like retail and a few other areas, um, the sort of that ethical consideration is not yet as mature, but I completely agree with everybody that's um, everybody at the individual level, okay, wants to do good, okay? It's, I think it's around the maturity of, of an organization, right, and its capacity to understand the impact, right, of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Mm -hmm. And so bringing the conversation across to you guys, uh, Roberto, do you think that the understanding, as Tom mentioned here, of the definition of good can actually run the gamut of a large organization? Because there may be somebody uh, doing the HR department who has very different objectives um, uh, to maybe the finance department. So how would you bring that together when it comes to ethics for business? Well, the, the first thing is that I think we need to understand here and then that when you talk about artificial intelligence, if we talk about ethics in artificial intelligence, in a disjoint way from what has been years and years of a code of conduct as a company we've been published, we will make a mistake because we'll make that to appear something that is a bubble by itself. So the, the uh, of course, the difficulty when you talk about ethics and you're not talking about compliance because there's a difference between what is a law and what is ethics, right? And we can get very philosophical very quickly, but we're not going to do it. Uh, it's how do I create a common ground of ethics where the perception culturally, functionally, organization would be very different. And I think the most companies have been approaching this in the right way, which is let's have the conversation. So let's have the questions. So let's discuss whether what we, our posture, like you have a risk posture in a bank, in a company you should have an ethical posture and saying, is this something we all recognize as a common ground, a common denominator about ethics? And then it's gonna be uh, part that goes into how you deal with your vendors and then part that says how you deal with your data. But it's kind of, a, it's part under the same umbrella. Mm -hmm. Okay then. And so, Mark, I know you have a biological background. Um, do you feel that ethics is something that comes naturally to businesses? I mean, it may not be something that we automatically apply to artificial systems 
maybe they're not conscious enough to come up with their own ethics. But we, we bandy this around like it's a, a general understanding of what ethics should be, something that is for good. Is that a natural thing? Uh, well, you see, is there any ethics in nature? Um, discuss. Uh, it's a very complicated question. The answer is no, actually, if you're uh, Darwinian anyway. Um, I think um, I agree with the, with the uh, approach that individuals have ethics, but businesses don't. I think the big problem, however, with AI is explainability. I think when you've got layers and layers of complexity, actually unpicking why decisions were made is vital, and yet, in some instances, nigh on impossible. So at that point, you're depending on ethics you don't understand. And that troubles me, and uh, and I think there will be a, a wave of uh, away from black box towards white box explainable, and that's going to be the greatest challenge that AI faces, in my view. Okay, and so when it comes to explainable artificial intelligence, I'm going to bring this back to you, Fernando. Mm. If you can explain the artificial intelligence, does it have an impact that is negative when it comes to its accuracy or the result of? using an AI, like why, why, why do it if it's simple enough that like us dumb human beings can manage to explain something? I mean, the interesting thing, and I'd love to hear the others' view, is that uh, I'm sure most of the people on this table don't understand how maglev train works. Um, actually, I actually, I do. Actually, I do. And I do as well, sadly. But, but at, at, I mean, at a real level, literally looking at these things that are massively engineered and have you know, billions of pieces and stuff. Um, but there is an entire industry that you know deals with that, and we trust it. And we've uh, over the years they've built that trust and built evolutions of this thing. So now we don't know how it works, but we get on it. Uh, and then the same thing happens with laws. And there's, there's laws that govern our behavior. So we're not so good that we our ethical frameworks just work on their own. We send people to jail when their ethical boundaries are broken, right? So even though the technology itself might be, we have this explainability issue at the moment because it's nascent, there's not enough people working on it, there's not enough people that understand it and all that stuff. Over time, that will go away. As it relates to performance, I'm, I struggle to find examples where where and a good example of this is voice. None of us complains of using speech to text systems, which are mostly unexplainable because they're obvious. Uh, in banking, there's a lot of examples that are difficult to explain, but I don't think the performance is hindered by putting things in place to help it be explained at the moment. So you've got that balance of, do you really have examples that are so necessary that they get to be so complex that explaining it is going to break the good that it brings? I haven't seen them. You might have some in you know, university and research and all these kind of things. But today, our thrust should be to have enough people in society that understand it at a sufficient level, the maglev example, that you, that you trust it without necessarily understanding the principles of, uh, of how magnets work or, or superconductors or anything like that. Uh, same for biology, right? We, we don't necessarily trust or know, understand how a, a heart valve works, but we'll go and get a heart valve transplant, right? So I think that's the balance of it, but I don't think explainability is, is hinders effectiveness, if that was the core of the question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay. And so, Ross, you're, you've been starting to use um, artificial intelligence systems, machine learning in business. Have you had to find ways to, to make that transparent in those companies, or is it more a matter of the proof is in the result? So I've got a similar opinion to Tom, which is I think AI is based on math. And stat statistics mm -hmm. and actually within Thames Water we're very much using it for machine learning and robotic process automation rather and then also starting to move to the data science and the algorithmic end um, I think the, th the, the thing about it is it needs to be fair I think you have to have standards and ultimately the individuals and I take the panel's view that says everybody is an individual wants to do the right thing but ultimately they have to know where the boundary is and this is for the head of this panel, I was looking at the EU Commission on what they're looking at and their standards that they are leading the US at the moment across Europe with a specialist panel to try and look at um, specifically trustworthy AI. And the three tenants that that's based on is, is the respect for the human um, autonomy around fairness and around accountability. And then there are seven tests against that mm. and how you use that. It's the same thing, and, and Roberto and I have worked a lot around GDPR and governance. Mm -hmm. I think there has to be a governing body to know what the rules are, to know when you're breaking them. Mm -hmm. And it's about outcomes 
And ultimately, it's about being fair to consumers that if there is something that is, there is a decision made by a computer which negatively impacts them, that they have the right to challenge, mm -hmm. would be my view. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so why are we so bothered by artificial intelligence <laughs> when there are other technologies that we don't understand, that we don't seem to be as freaked out about in society? Do you, do you have a view on that? Yeah, I, I do. I think um, other technologies are we're less bothered by because, well, it does it impact us on a daily basis, right? When you look at your phone, the amount of technology that's built into your phone that's using artificial intelligence, using machine learning, right? It's just uh, scale fold, right? So it touches us every day. And our discomfort comes from the fact that we know that there are companies out there that intentionally, oh, I would say unintentionally naturally, right, have released products that have negatively affected us as a population, right, as, you know, um, people, okay? So um, there is that kind of wariness now because there have been, have been these occurrences. But should we be more or less uh, wary? No, is my view. Mm -hmm. But we should be more conscious about you know, how machine learning is used and, and how it applies to us on a daily basis, right? So um, the, when you look at, you know, the future of machine learning, okay, I think people's discomfort really isn't around the data per se, because it's around that algorithm, okay? And the algorithm changes every second of every day, okay? We need a, we as, users of that machine learning, right? We need to be comfortable, right, in that trustworthy AI, yeah. And so, Roberta, do you think that it is some of the, maybe the high profile mistakes that are, that we're having trouble with? I mean, we have things like, you know, the, the Microsoft chatbot that went horribly wrong and very publicly yeah, so. That was. But there's also, you know, there's machine learning that can be very subtly applied in data situations, which we're not necessarily aware of unless it just makes things a little bit easier. In those cases, though, do we forget to apply ethics because suddenly it's becoming convenient? Well, that's an interesting point because um, I think the, the bubbles we're dealing with usually is what is feasible and within that what is ethical and within that, well, within that what is legal within that what is ethical and then at a certain point you get to what is good good for my customer and, and what is good for my customer doesn't necessarily all the time coincide with what is ethical so that that's in itself i think is an ethical point so but back to the the perception i think the perception today that bothers most of us is as citizens and i'm a bit of a data socialist about it is that there is an imbalance between corporations and the citizen on what you can do with my data, what I can do with my data. Although I have my disposal, the Googles, the Facebooks, whatever, uh, but in terms of uh, saying what you can do with my data is way more complex, way more non-transparent, and uh, sometimes it's convenient for me, sometimes it's not, but I don't have the means myself, I don't have the power myself to gauge whether what you're doing independently is good for me. So go back to, going back to if we were having a much more established data sovereignty, so I know and I'm in charge of what I have produced as, you know, because we are producers of data all the time, when now sensors are emitting all kinds of data, will probably give me more of a sense of trust and I say, okay, I can give it to you because I have in my, in my hands something I can control without knowing whether the maglev works or not. I have something that is a gizmo in my hands that is kind of certified by a third party and let's not go in that, that says, oh, what you're doing with my data is actually fine. So I'm okay that the outcome I'm getting is based on stuff that I can trust you with. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mark, I can see you nodding through parts of that. What's your take Not on this way having, our, <laughs> 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 having our insurance? Do you, and can we cope with it? I mean, if I had all of my medical data, I might not know what to, to do with it. Maybe I wouldn't understand it all. Uh, well, if you, you, if you specifically took medical data and you had a particular condition or disease, um, the solution to that condition or disease is based on the evidence from thousands, possibly millions of people earlier. So actually it's a manifestation of, uh, of machine learning, if you like, or it's human learning anyway. So there are lots of situations where sharing data is actually for society's good. I think where I'm 
I'm troubled by um, uh, things that I see is when it's not obvious I've given permission for that. Mm. So uh, uh, most software products that you use in a social context will have T's and C's that are made deliberately impenetrable. And none of us read them, in truth. Let me um, check there. Has anyone read T's and C's? Some of the longer ones that we get on commonly used software, I won't name anyone. The 32 pages on my Samsung TV? Yeah. No, it's a long T's and C's It's a read. good read. Yeah. <laughs> I think the answer is no, and uh, <laughs> and so when you see and you see this, you, you saw at the, the, the beginning there are, there are moments where what's happening seem very helpful to you. So, in Google, you're searching for uh, say um, Serengeti pictures of Serengeti, and then the next time you look at something, there's adverts for flights to Kenya. I don't remember giving permission for that. Now most people wouldn't even notice that. Now I've told you, you will, right? And probably you already know this, but it's those little tiny sort of um, edges towards personalization which I'm not sure I gave permission for which trouble me. And the other thing that, that I find um, uh, mildly concerning about, about developments is that is the pace of change has accelerated very considerably. I occasionally give presentations, I look back at the history of communication to Caxton, 500 years ago, printing press, uh, 300 years after that, a postal service that could send the stuff around the country. Twice my age ago, before you could have a synchronous telephone conversation across the Atlantic, 50 years for email, 25 years for text messaging roughly, now boom, there are millions and millions of different ways of communicating with people. How do we control that? How do we know what we're doing is right in those contexts? And government's not able to even understand this, let alone catch up with it. And citizens need to, have, um, need to be protected from corporations in my view, and I'm not sure that happens very well. And certainly not transparent. If you, look at, as well. you look at the Cambridge Analytica debate at the moment about influencing, you know, results. That's an indication of, of you know, di we didn't give permission for that information to be used. Mm. And so I think going back to what your business does, it does it very effectively of targeting mass media and mass communication and stops mundane things happening for humans and actually gets a known result at the end of it and actually can be used for good. And I think that then comes back to a bit of the conversations I've had with yourselves and, mm -hmm. and at, at Accenture and then with Microsoft is using AI for good. So for example, you mentioned about the medical, if you look at the x-rays and trying to find pneumonia, yes, you are going to find pneumonia and cancer better than having a human reviewing it, but AI should be used to augment human intelligence, not replace it. Mm -hmm. Is it not the case, though, that um, with every technology, there's going to be people who will explore the limits of what it can do by doing something that is not very ethical? <laughs> so, and, and do you get good out of that in the end? I th I th you know, out of bad situations become good and some good. It, it's about learning. Yeah. And what do we teach the, the robots to do? You know, if we're looking at a process and you're using robotics to try and uh, replace a process, which one is either trying to find where it's broken, which causes customers to be affected. And we were having a conversation earlier. You know, if you go back to, and we've used lots of the descriptions, but if you go back to Maslow's hierarchy, there is a need. And first is water, then food, then heat, and then you start to mm. go up that. And actually, um, again, for a water company, one of the things that if you don't have water, you die after you, uh, three days. So that's pretty fundamental. So we've got a, mm. a position whereby we care for and look after humans and 10 to 15 million of them. And, and whether we use AI or whether we use a pumping station and whether we do stuff, we, you know, if, if I look at the number of alerts we get uh, in South London alone, it's 2.8 million alerts per day. We cannot have enough people to look at those alerts and identify which are the ones that are important. So we have to start to employ technology to enable us to augment decision making on which is the right decision and what's the wrong decision. And as long as we get coming back to the maths and the stats right and somebody checks that those algorithms are effective, which goes back to proper testing and having feedback loops, then I'm comfortable with it. Okay. Mm. So, Fernando, I can mm. hear you agreeing with some parts of that. We don't always agree. <laughs> We're <No. just> being, <laughs> being very well behaved. Um, but do, do you feel that those checks and balances uh, are available to us now while we're entering into areas of using things like machine learning mm. um, and developing artificial intelligence for different businesses. Yeah. Is it possible to have those people there to catch that or are we just not 
trained uh, than a lot of people. Well, this is this is where I was humming and not always agreeing. Uh, <laughs> no change. <laughs> yeah, no change. In, interestingly, this this is the era of the dangerous amateur. It is literally the era of the dangerous amateur. In the same way that you wouldn't uh, employ an architect who hasn't got an architecture degree and actually has gone through the rigor of building a house and making it structurally available, we're more than happy to hire people to build machine learning who frankly don't pass that test by any stretch of the imagination. So, so to some degree, we've got this, the, the issue of how are we gonna, and it goes back to education and literacy. Um, if we were all a lot more literate about machine, we have debated before about machine learning versus AI, let's not start it now, but, but if we were all a lot more literate about machine learning, much of this would go away. Not, not, your, not your quandaries with ownership of data, that's, a, that's a, an important societal problem, but much of this would go away as we wouldn't be making up what we think is an impact to us when reality technology cannot get there kind of thing. Um, so the education piece is massively important. Um, and the dangerous amateur, and I say that lovingly, but how do we turn more of the people around us into rather than dangerous amateurs where the, the ethical boundaries are gonna have to be incredibly hard. You and I have discussed this where if, if out of the group of uh, data scientists that would act ethically because they're well-trained and educated and understand those principles is X, and society needs X times a million, then we're gonna have to impose all of these systems just to make people fit. Mm -hmm. Because it's not that they don't wanna be ethical, it's just that, and again, we have examples, I'll give you my, 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 my most uh, loving example, which is um, in a situation where you're trying to sell a product and you've got a model and you've got data, and, uh, and it's all okay up to then, and you create an algorithm. Uh, and the only people doing the peer review of this algorithm, they all look like me, they're all, bald Western men in their 40s, handsome and, and well-educated. Um, <laughs> should we be surprised, even though there's plenty of good ethics there and plenty of good will, that what comes out of it may not be appropriate for everyone? And it's, a, you know, it's an ethical question, but again, with an, we're gonna have to impose an ethical system because there's just not enough variety and density for this to self-regulate itself. And even then, do we self-regulate architects and engineers and doctors? We don't. So why should we treat this any differently? Mm -hmm. So why aren't we learning then from other sectors? Or, or do we need to then sort of reverse engineer how we work with, as you say, mm. doctors and architects? Is that something that you feel would benefit that we learn from AI and now start applying those pressures to, to more established businesses? Absolutely, absolutely. There is no reason why if you have the ability to, to do good, but also the ability to do harm, mm -hmm. that you put yourself in a position where there's a minimum ability to control and govern this with flexibility. We still make doctors, we still make nurses, we still make engineers. I'm an electronic engineer. Nobody would let me even close to a piece of technology if I didn't. So yes, society needs to evolve to do this. And the, another problem that Tom and I have discussed a lot is there's no one ML. There's not one AI. Yeah. There's, I mean, I, even Accenture, in my, even in my team, I have very people who are very specialist in certain types of modeling, certain type of mathematics, certain types of data. So it's a, but in the same way, doctors have immense amount of fields, and so there's going to be a professional. I call it the professionalization of machine learning. There is going to be in the next five years a real push. There has to be for the professionalization, and it's going to come two ways, from businesses. I have a customer who has 8,000 data scientists. I've never seen such a thing. They're, it's the Wild West. They need to professionalize that or they'll bust. And then from universities and so on, who are gonna start seeing with more of their courses, more of their density happening, a need to, and the ethics comes a lot from those institutions, to start adding some of that professionalization levels. So I think that's where but it's isn't gonna that, come. Isn't that to do with the how new it is? Because if you look at lawyers and doctors, they have standards and then they're disbarred and stop from practicing. Quite. When have you ever had a data scientist who's disbarred from practicing? All they do is they move companies. No, but some should. I, 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 it's one thing, quite, but also there are, there are countries who've got people employed to try and break into and break companies and try and take stuff. Right. You know, so there is good and bad in the world. I think we just need to recognize that. But the thing is what we don't have, I believe yet, is what are the common standards that says, here's the boundary and where are we on the right side or the wrong side of it? And so it's mm -hmm. therefore up to individual companies. Mm -hmm. And sometimes companies are there to, uh, you know, they have commercial pressures to make money because otherwise if they don't get a return on equity, then they'd go bust. 
So where do the people who are above those, mm -hmm. who are on the boards, do they, unless they're a company like yours, which is about AI as your product, it's, you know, it's, it's a niche area that you have very specialist and you hope and trust that those individuals are responsible and accountable. Thus, we're going to move to, to we're going to move necessarily to professionalization. It has to happen. It's happened before. So. It will happen again. I, I I really like this thread of discussion, but I think there is a concept out there that um, that is on the table right in society right now, which is the concept of a citizen data scientist, mm -hmm. right? And when we talk about lawyers, we talk about doctors and their certifications. It's the lawyers and the doctors that are acting right on the operation itself that actually invoke the efficacy, right, the ethics of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. In a machine learning, artificial intelligence world, right, I'm building something that takes the action, right? Mm -hmm. So should it be that the, controversial maybe, right, should it be that the professionalization, mm -hmm. right, is not necessarily with the individual, but there's a professional association mm -hmm. that says, Okay, you must pass this set of tests, mm -hmm. right? In order to in, in order for your uh, model, right, to invoke certain actions, and the actions that you will invoke will determine the tests that you have to pass, right? Because it's not necessarily the individual, right, that's performing the action anymore. Mm -hmm. They're just building a machine to invoke the actions. I think we're saying the same thing in slightly different ways. At different layers of society, we're going to need these things. In the same way that you go on uh, robots to make they do operations, right? The, the surgeries. They are this. If you've ever been involved in anything to do how that ends up in an operating theater, I promise you, all that is totally professionalized. There's no chance it gets there, and that's on one extreme of automation that we may want to protect deeply. But there's no reason why not exactly. You, you by the time you end up. In a, as, as your first job, you've come out of university, you already have a set of foundations and boundaries of how this gets done and it's priming on how to do things well and what a good looks like. And it, it will vary from country to country. In China, it may look in a certain shape. In Russia, it might look in a certain shape. In Brazil, it might look in a certain shape. And in London, it might look in a certain other shape. It's exactly the same for everything else. Um, every time I get into an elevator in any country, I wonder what their standards are for safety. And I hope to God they buy them from Germany. Yeah. <laughs> Schneider is not Schindler. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> Usual thing. Electricity <laughs> elevators. Two different things. So we've got sort of you know the idea of a standardization here of the idea of ethics, but obviously the variation between different cultures. If we're looking at, say, the innovation of artificial intelligence at this stage, because it's so nascent, so early. Do we end up with a homogenized product that kind of doesn't actually enter into areas of innovation? Will we be missing something, Mark? Uh, it's an interesting question. I, I have a, um, I work out of, uh, at least in part, out of Bletchley Park, and I was at a, um, uh, an event a few weeks ago, which was a 75th anniversary of the world's first programmable computer, Colossus. And Colossus was um, uh, run by four types of people. It was run by wire men, who were often women, who in effect were DevOps, software engineers like Turing, uh, linguists and mathematicians. Right? That continuum is exactly the same challenge of communication and ML and the work that I do, exactly the same thing today. So um, I strongly hold the two views. Um, one, We've got a terrible problem earlier in the process with education. It is a scandal that in my country only 10% of uh, engineers are uh, women. It's just scandalous. That's one thing. So we need to improve that and we need more cognitive diversity in the way that we develop AI as well. This isn't the preserve of software engineers or mathematicians or psychologists or linguists or whatever other discipline, biologists, whatever other discipline you want to throw in there. It, it's the preserve of all of those disciplines and that cognitive diversity will help to spread the these ideas and learnings from other disciplines as well and bring that together so you create something that's for societal good, not one group of people's perception of societal good. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so um, if I am the CEO of a, a company looking to use, say, machine learning, where do, wh where do I stand at the moment? I mean, Roberto, is it possible to get all of the people that Mark's talking about sort of in this fabulous A-team? Uh, to apply artificial intelligence to my business and then, then know that I feel that I'm rigorously doing exactly the right thing? Or is it important to experiment for businesses with what we have at the moment? I think there are 
there is this misconception that experimentation should then necessarily give you a finite product that you can throw in operations immediately. I think there's a conveyor belt between it's good to experiment, but then moving from the test bed, where you're agile, well, whatever you want to call it, the activity you're doing with um, people are throwing whatever data sets and trying to play with things, there's a moment in which that this there's stage gates to get you from what you experimented through what it can be actually productized. And those stage gates are the ones in which you start to reduce the degree of freedom and say, oh, you've done all this stuff now. Have you tested for bias? Have you tested for regulation? Have you tested for privacy? Have you tested? So there, there is a flow. And I don't think necessarily, coming from a banking environment, when you were talking about models, and the, especially probability of default models, I mean, if you've been in a, with the Federal Reserve, there's an incredibly structure in a way of delivering something that will decide whether you have right to get loans for me or not. And I don't think that is widely spread in, in, the, in, the, in businesses. So I think the methodologies and the professionality and the, 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 the processes around this new thing are not there yet in the majority of places. So there's more like the, you know, there's a rush for gold. Oh, yeah, we need to do intelligence, artificial intelligence, because that's what the customer wants, really. And there's, there's, there's a bit, uh, but there are more and more, uh, you know, serious conversation happening and saying, right, how many and how, where should I have my data scientists and, and what is going to be my, you know, my, my organization around it? What's going to be my process around it? I think there's a, a structure needs to be built to make sure that Can I come back to that for a second? Please. So, again, you guys all, all work for companies. Actually, Mark and I work for many companies. I'll give you what I see as a true observation. The, the era of the experimentation without the conveyor belt is dead. It is dead. The, the nine out of 10 CEOs have had it with the money that's been thrown at experiments that don't have the conveyor belt. Yeah. If there's a conveyor belt, they're happy as Larry. But I'll tell you now, the percentage of stuff in the AI world that ends in experiments that don't go anywhere is staggering. I mean, staggering. It but you is, know, but you know that, sorry. The conveyor belt is wonderful. We're, we're we blowing that, a bit of our, our trumpet here because mm -hmm. the difference between a good experiment that gets to oper operationalization correctly and a bad one is most of the time, how good is the data out there? Mm. Because what you usually you create is a shiny algorithm here that works perfectly in uh, incredibly sanitized conditions. And then when you'll free it in the operations, the data out there is not good enough for this thing to survive. Yeah. And that's what has been killing a lot of the, our digital my, transformation. My experience is, which is interesting, and this is where we see it as more flow, free flowing, is that there's actually an entire category, a very large category of the data is okay, the algorithm is great, the company just doesn't even know how to put this into a place where it's going to be live. They don't even know how to get it done. Banks are a prime example of, here's this wonderful model that's going to score and give me a great, no, I don't even know how to put it into production. I mean, it's mechanically impossible because they haven't got the foundations for it, because they haven't got the systems for it, because they haven't got the way to operate it, blah, 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 blah. To maintain so, it. To maintain to it. Secure it. And then, so I think there's several layers. You've pointed out one of my favorite scenarios, which is one where it, it's all playing out and, and the company has, been, has had the, the foresight to think, I don't need to put into production a million different things. Four or five things that are, that are valuable are enough. And I'll put more as they come. And the conveyor belt moves. It's almost, and I, I hate to say this, we need to, this is a whole, a whole layer of technology to do more with less. The whole principle of it. I've been doing it for 25 years, more with less. It's not possible that we're in some cases doing less with more. I mean, it's almost staggering. And this comes, this comes back to the thing that the last time we met that I got from your conversation about AI, and it's the 10x and the plus 10. Mm. The critical thing is, is, to, is to learn fast and know when to stop, but importantly, to pick the things that are going to give you a 10 times return mm. versus a plus 10% return. And knowing the difference for that, but still having the ethics and the guidelines and the governance and the principles comes down to mm. sometimes you've got to make a gut feel bet. Quite. And it Quite. still comes down to human behavior to turn around and say, do I have enough knowledge and experience mm. and skills to be able to make to call the right decision? And we should explain the 10 times. Sorry, it's, it's, yeah. it's my principle that you shouldn't do anything that doesn't have a 10 time multiplier. If it has a 10% gain, don't do it. It's a just, a, I mean, we're all in AI, so it's interesting. Tom and I have discussed it many times. Um, it's not a perfect rule, but it's a good rule to stop when you're just learning. And I'm sorry, the, the age of learning is also kind of, in companies, is kind of starting to go away. It's the age of, the age of results. Less results, maybe, 
Is that one of the main problems then? I mean, it's interesting, um, you've touched on it here as well, that um, you, you said that customers like to know we're working with AI. Is it the customers or is it investors? Like who are companies answering to when they're saying, oh, we're definitely doing some AI and, and maybe mm. too much of it and maybe it's a mess and maybe it's an experiment. depends if you're private equity backed. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> or trying to find money in California. <laughs> yeah. But do you, I don't know, do you, from around the table generally jump in, do you feel that there are outside business pressures that just cloud these decisions and we've just got another buzzword? It's like saying mm. blockchain, I'm sorry. Yeah. The yeah. CEO saying, this year we're going to do big data mm. and everybody looking at each other. So I'll give you, can I give you a bit of data, hard data? Um, in the analysis that we did. It's for, good quality, yeah. It's good quality, it's good quality. <laughs> uh, we did about the, an interview with about 50 or 60 chief execs and people in AI and banks and, and law firms and stuff for the City UK, which is the, the body that they all belong to. And what we found is just super interesting which is that um, if the, the, to the CEO saying, we're going to do AI, we found that the people that do really well and actually get outcomes from the CEO saying that tend to be firms where the distance between the CEO and the people that make the decision is small. Law firms, because the CEO is a partner and he has partnership in his business, he's understood what this is and he's transferring it well. Where we saw no great deal of outcomes, the distance was very large. In, and I say distance in communication, passing on the strategy, understanding of what it means, right? And uh, obviously, this is a limited field of banks, insurance companies, so big banks tended to be in that category to some degree, where the CEO is saying, we're going to do AI, it's wonderful. And most of the time, they didn't understand. And the translation to the people that were doing it, it's just, you could not draw a line and say somebody in the engine room has said, yeah, I've got that, got that. I'll be making you some valuable stuff that apply and relate to what you say is AI. But and it's we also, saw the same thing in big banks. It's also right? true that sometimes you have to have a vision, not necessarily right, have right. the capabilities to yet, right? So I think there is a correlation between, okay, what the market will think of you if you say certain things. That's, mm -hmm. You can't avoid, you can't get away from that. If you're a listed company, you definitely there's going to be some multipliers coming in, 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 mm -hmm. in and play if you, instead of being the product company, you are a digital company. That's mm -hmm. definitely. But aside from that, I think, there is a definitely this the buzzwords, but definitely there is also a, a, a genuine, genuine interest in saying, is this gonna give me gonna give my customer, my employees a better experience? Because that that's that's the driver for making the customer journeys better or more uh, stickier. Mark, is Mark, is Mark saying? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm not sure where I go. Because I can't see you. Right? So I, can't, I can't see your body reaction. Uh, uh, so I'm a, a, a Shoreditch based, as you can tell from the tattoos, uh, scale up tech company. So uh, I know all about this. I've worked my, my career, I've worked all the way through from friends and family, angels, VCs, PE, trade sale, IPO, the whole shooting match. Um, it's, um, can I say b bingo? I mean, that's the wor world that we live in, in, in with a lot of uh, investment businesses or b businesses that seek investment. And there is uh, an awful amount of um, uh, economy with truth about what technology is actually being used inside businesses. Uh, there is some evidence that half, perhaps three quarters of companies that say AI are simply backing that off to a third party mm -hmm. service. Um, I don't subscribe to that. My business built its um, machine learning algorithms, which is a subset of AI, and we can have this debate. Statistical learning, I think it's maths. <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> we built that ourselves uh, from the ground up in order to, to create um, uh, a vision, if you like. I hate to describe myself as a visionary, it's too pretentious. But, but, a, but a vision of explainability in what we do. But what we do is quite simple. We're not trying to drive cars, we're trying to have simple conversations with people. So um, absolutely the investment community is interested in these buzzwords. I can never think of anything to do with blockchain in my business. At some point I will, but otherwise I've got them all. But there's a truth behind every single one, which is relatively rare. And the investment community is getting wise to this. Um, if you use the uh, the trough of disillusionment, that, that wonderful um, uh, analysis that Gartner do, um, it, it's starting to, to tip off the mm. top. And uh, and this, uh, look, um, AI was arguably invented two and a half thousand years ago, but if you regard Turing as the beginning point, it's 19... 50, every 10 years this happens. Every 10 years, the you know, Skynet is reconceived in whatever form it, uh, it one wants, and then it falls off the trough because it doesn't deliver on things. Um, I think it's a little different now. I think the pace of change is quicker, uh, but there needs to be more truth behind what is actually AI and what isn't. Which is an important, you've both probably heard me say that everybody lies. I start the, the years, every, fun, every year I start with everybody lies, and I know everybody exaggerates, and then I turn very quick to everybody lies. 
And when I, I, I use that as a, bit of, as a way to just, you know, inside the room into action, what I try to say is that, and if, in some cases, there's nothing wrong with that, Roberto, I like your view on it, is in some cases, it's okay to have a vision and it's a bit exaggerated and it's a bit inflated and it's a bit, you know, hyped and, and sometimes that's okay. If you're a company with 400,000 people, you need to incite people to action. Maybe you need to incite them to action. Um, but there's also quite a lot of uh, downsides with that. My, my favorite example is the, the business inadequacy, where you feel slightly inadequate if you're not doing some things that you've heard Amazon do, and Tom, you and I have discussed this a lot. And then you go back and say, yeah, but uh, in context, to be honest, what I'm doing is perfectly valuable. Yeah, it's yeah. really difficult when, you, when you're being fed this exaggeration by a lot of these things, then which goes into the hype, which goes into the dip. So one of the, my favorite behaviors in CEOs is when they're actually at peace with this and they sit back and they say they're doing more with less and they actually quite have a lot of clarity about the five things they want to do and how it's going to change their company. And they may have a very hyped message, but when you actually talk to them, they're really clear about the things they want to do. Mm -hmm. But everybody lies. <laughs> I'm not, 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 <laughs> not to bring that phrase. Yeah. 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 And on this note. <laughs> yeah. Who do I bring that phrase to next? I'm sorry, Tom, I'm going to yeah. bring it to you. I don't mean anything yeah. by it. But how do you bring a, a message then of, of considered technology, uh, whether it's artificial intelligence, I mean, certainly artificial intelligence in this case, without sort of fear words, without the Skynet, but on the other side of it, without just saying, well, you're just going to have to do it without questioning it. Organizations are quite vast. Buy-in sometimes has to be at multi levels. Do you do you feel that that it's portrayed as an opportunity, or that it's clearly explained within businesses and, and larger organizations? I think when you talk about uh, bringing machine learning and artificial intelligence to uh, an organization, um, most companies, right? I'm not talking about the tech companies, startups, things like that. You can talk about it in, in, in the delivery of the business benefit, the colleague benefit, right? And that is how you would essentially uh, bring it to the organization in terms of you don't really need the business at large to really understand that it's a maglev train. You don't need to understand that it's uh, uh, mathematics, statistics, machine learning. Okay, what you really need the business at large to understand is the benefits that it brings. And then what you also need to bring to the table, okay, is then if you are using machine learning and artificial intelligence to talk about, okay, the, the validations, right, the, the guarantees that you're putting around that, that piece of technology, right, which will enable that outcome, okay. So, I don't think there's this um, huge gap, chasm, right, to bringing machine learning to organizations. It is really still, because we are all businesses in that sense, right, talking about the customer, talking about the colleague. But when you do talk about using machine learning, you have to bring to the table, right, okay, I'm going to do this for the customer. To do this for the customer, here's the guarantees that I'm going to put in place because I am using machine learning, right? So that way the business can talk positively, can talk confidently, right, around what is being produced. The customer, right, can feel confident, right? And, you know, I may not know all the details, but I know that the business, you know, is actually ethical, right, in that and how it's operating on, on my behalf. So that's, that's the other interesting thing about standards we were yeah. talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, where we're using machine learning, for example, we have to be as good or better than humans to get the results to move it forward, even though it will be cheaper. Mm -hmm. Why are we putting higher standards on machines mm -hmm. which can do the jobs and make people's jobs more enjoyable? And why aren't we just asking for, you know, it can be as good as, as long as it doesn't affect an individual in a negative manner? I just don't get that mentality still with AI or machine learning or any of the stuff that we do with data. And that, and that does go back to the issue of education as well. I have conversation with lots of clients where I describe the, the threshold of performance at being 90%. Mm. 
And then people say, well, that's not enough. It needs to be 100%. And then you reply by saying, what, well, like humans aren't? Uh, and then you have to sort of edge your technology in. So you have to say, okay, so you employ people between nine and five. What happens to the customer that contacts you at five past five on a Friday? They are 48 hours or more away from a response. So, okay, we'll use it then and we'll be happy with 90% then. So you introduce that and suddenly people think that's performing better than the human call center, say. So actually it's okay to edge that into the call center as well. And that does two things. It improves the customer experience but it also improves the call center person's experience as well because they the churn rate in call centers is extraordinary because a lot of the roles are not jobs that human beings like so if you can take those away and give them the more enjoyable parts of, uh, of, of a customer conversation where they're using empathy and all those yeah. things that humans do that machines never will, then you can have a, a happier customer, happier um, a staff member and more efficient business. Yeah. And then you can make more profits and make a better service for people. I think you make an entire data science community in the world really happy if they don't have to explain precision and recall 25 times a day <laughs> to anybody and everybody every time they do an experiment. But again, it goes back to education. Mm. Yes. And so to to bring things around to a final discussion point, and, and there are different ways of answering this. I'm going to come to you in different ways, I think. What's the risk if companies are not already starting to work with artificial intelligence in one form or another? I mean, is there is a huge risk of failure, or is it something that we come to on our own time? Or is it being specific about our needs? I mean, Ross, what do you feel about the, the use of AI? I mean, because it's such a... So a wash at the moment with investment money and, and it's so popular. Are, are we actually at risk if we're not using AI? No, I don't think we are. I think it's degrees. And I think all of the companies are, who I've spoken to is start small and learn. Mm -hmm. And very much where we're coming from is the use of it is very, at the moment, tactical. It's very specific and it has very clear outcomes. I think if you bear those three things in mind before you embark on a project, whether we should or shouldn't use it, work out if you can just do something, you know, we, we're looking at trying to predict risk and actually coloring maps has more effect than trying to build a complete solution at the moment. So actually sometimes basics can be better, but so I, so my view is use it tactically and use it for the right things. Rob and I disagree on this a lot and we've disagreed we not, very, not very long ago actually. Um, <laughs> Uh, maybe it's a slightly different way of seeing the world, but um, no, there's no risk if you're not doing it. That's a, it's not neither here nor there. Um, but if you are going to do it, uh, and this is not where we disagree, it has to be very value driven. It has to be what is value? What is it that's going to help my customers or my whatever field you live in? And then you work your way back into this technology, not the other way around. Otherwise, this is not the usual problem of technology looking for a problem. This technology is so broad. I mean, it'll be like a wave attacking you of, of different technologies looking for problems and you'll never end. Um, but on the, one, the, one, the one we do disagree slightly, and again, it's, 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 uh, it's no reflection on what these guys are doing, is that generally where we see more success is not the start small tactical, but really determine what's valuable and get that done as a big broad thing that actually solves a fundamental problem. Um, and again, it, talking about this at a high level is dangerous, but because in most cases, the starting small has, has not been controlled like you guys have, where you literally went for the problem and it was meaningful, even though tactical. You get a lot of meaningless, non-tactical, not interesting experimentation that doesn't amount to very much. So I tend, we tend to see it as more of a, God, grab a problem, like the kind of problems, Mark, you tend to deal with. Grab a problem and just solve it end to end. And from that, build the ability to do other things cheaper and quicker. So you've learned a large sway of problem rather than little pieces. That's the that's where I tend to see it. Mm -hmm. Tom, do you agree? Uh, I think I, I come at it from a retail perspective, okay? And from a retail perspective, and more importantly, from an online perspective, the, the tr traditional retail engagements don't exist anymore, okay? You d people don't walk into a store, talk to a person, right, and have that richness of experience in a retail environment. There's still some retailers that do do that specifically, right, like Nike does that, have that whole experience. But if you don't have that richness of experience, you have to, have to, you have to generate a proxy for it. So online in retail, most, if not all retailers, try to create a richness of engagement, a detail of engagement. And how did that come about? That comes around. That comes about through forms of personalization, right? So, in my view, okay, 
as a retailer, if you're not engaged, right, in some journey to having more richer engagement, more richer experiences, which more generally takes guys in artificial intelligence, machine learning, okay, you are at risk. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, all right, maybe a long <laughs> bit more than said, Roberto. Does it look risky if you're not already playing with AI? No, I don't think so. The risk you're running is really that if you're doing this just because I want I want one of those, right? Mm -hmm. Which is happening in your data journey, in your digital journey, any any business transformation that you do just for the sake of it, yeah. it's probably you risking. So but back to I mean, I agree with a few views in there, but and bottom line for me is that if you commit to that you can't just think about it as an isolated moment in your company. It has to be properly, it's like a new organ that you need to fill in the body. So you need to understand the function is going to play and then you need to connect with everything else that's happening in the company. So having that just experimentation doesn't work. Having, having be creating the full shebang from the beginning probably is going to be overwhelming. So having an understanding of the journey and asking yourself the right question, why are we doing this? Because if we're doing this because all the others are doing it, then you're risking it. Okay, so we seem to be reaching a sort of a consensus. Mark, are you joining us on that? I, I think I have a slightly differing view, I think. Um, if you take certain services that you buy, broadband, your mobile phone connectivity, a bank loan, mortgages, it's quite a few actually. Um, they're all almost identical the services you get. Your phone just works, your broadband just works. So what's the difference? Well, the thing that people look for is price, all right? So that's the first one, I think. After that is service. Now, if you are in a business where your margins are eaten away because of competition, which is the case, water's too cheap, Ross, it's far too, I would pay 10 times more for my water. You can quote me on that. Call your guys. It's, <laughs> ma it's <laughs> madness, right? But if your margins are very low and you want to maintain that, that connection with your customer, you have no choice but to automate it. That's it. You have no choice. That is the future, that is happening, and that is the way it will be. You cannot have enough people, so you have to use machines. Perfect. All right. That's a good area to round things off on. But thank you all very much for this uh, premium human experience. That's not Tom. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's something that we've all been able to indulge in, which may become a luxury in the this future. Hard if hard life that way. Hard <laughs> <laughs> That's twice a month. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.